Hey everybody, we are Martin, Robert, and Francis, and this is Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready, we're about to live in your head, rent free. Hey everyone, welcome back to Snakes and Otters. We're excited, this is episode 5, we're recording outside, it's a really nice day. Uh, I'm Martin. I'm Robert. I'm Francis. Guys, I know our last uh, four episodes, we've done a lot of history stuff, and I wanted to do something a little different for episode 5. And hit a little pop culture stuff. Um, and of course, right now, very little is bigger in pop culture than comic book stuff. Amen. Uh, I guess so Game, true. Game of Thrones is probably the only thing that even approaches it. Uh, perhaps. Uh, perhaps we might even say that for posterity's future, Game of Thrones just ended two weeks ago and Avengers Endgame just dropped three weeks ago. Yep. So we're very much still basking in the glow of both <laughs> of these major pop culture events. So, listeners, this may surprise you, but uh, we're nerds, and we're big into comic book stuff. I know we sound uh, all debonair and worldly with our... Suave and boner. Yeah, with our witty repartee and bourbon talk, but um, we're, we're very much nerds, so... In the best sense of the word, thank you very much. <laughs> nerd, culture, nerd culture rules right now. Yeah. Yeah. It, because it, it is culture, as opposed to many other things that may masquerade as such and not be such. But, uh, you know, it wasn't ruling uh, 30 years ago, which is a disappointment, but it is kind of on top now. We have reached our ascendancy, sir. Everybody needs a nerd. Amen. And we're not, we're not going to fix your printer if you <laughs> make fun of us. So. That's right. The short answer is restart your system. <laughs> Don't call us until you reboot. Yep. That's right. And then do it again, just because. Just because. All right. So... What I wanted to get to, though, guys, is about comic books. What's the appeal? Why do we love them? What are we into this for? And and I know, in particular, from my experience, I'm you guys, of course, have much broader experience into it. My experience is pretty much limited to the Silver Age, mm -hmm. uh, in a, in a, early Bronze Age. Yeah, that, you would be some of that too. Yeah, through so the seventies. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty much a kind of that late seventies yeah. uh, swing through. But you guys have stayed with it much longer than I mm -hmm. have. So I, with that, with the Silver Age as a touchstone, what's the appeal? Why do we love them? And I guess we better define the Silver Age a little bit. So I'm gonna let Robert okay talk about that because I, I wanted to put him on the spot with this one. So you've got multiple eras that people talk about really for comic book history. In the beginning, uh, way back in the time of the dinosaurs, you have the Golden Age. Golden Age is really from the very beginning, in the mid-30s, up through, depending on who you talk to, the early 50s or the mid to late 50s. Depending Again, it depends on who you talk to. And that's primarily the DC stuff. So Superman, Batman. No, no, no there's lots of Marvel but, stuff there. There is, but DC does kind of get, uh, there's, uh, you kind of can, if you're looking for an issue, Oftentimes, you'll mark the beginning of the Golden Age with Action Comics number or number one or Detective Comics number 27. Batman right, because that's Superman. Batman, Batman Superman's and Superman. Batman and Superman, their very first, right. and they're right around the same time. Uh, and you can begin the, the Silver Age, which kind of morphs into the Marvel Age, but it doesn't start there, uh, with the beginning of the Flash on Earth, what eventually becomes Earth 1. I the not, New Flash. The New Flash, which I do not remember the issue. Showcase number four. Exactly, four. I it's a showcase, exactly. Yeah. Which, that's when they decided, and Julie Schwartz at DC is the one that did a lot of this, that says, we need to modernize this stuff because superheroes haven't sold since after the war. That's why yeah. most of them went away. Other than Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, superheroes, all those great Justice Society folks, of which I've been a long-time devotee, kind of faded away. They just weren't there anymore. And uh, it's in, if you saw Toy Story, you kind of get it. Because Woody and the cowboy stuff is fading away, and Sputnik and Buzz Lightyear and the Space Age are beginning. All yeah. this takes place, and that's why the uh, Justice Society, Julius Schwartz always said, sounded too much like you know uh, a, a card game club. It's it's not that a knitting club. He said it's not good enough. So he went to the National Football League or National or National League for Baseball and said that's the Justice League. And yeah, so. Though, yeah, broadly, that's the beginning in, of those two. The way I said, one of the reasons I said it, depending on who you talk to, Golden Age to me, and the Silver Age, I think there's an age in between, mm -hmm. where you've got the end of the superheroes, which is really very, very early fifties. Right. 
So you got about that five to eight year, because it takes a few years for it to get ramped up at DC. That's right. Um, period where it's mainly monster books, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's kind of the origin yeah. of Timely. Yeah, well, uh, that becomes Marvel, right? Well, becomes, Actually, that's Atlas. That's Atlas. At, which they ta- were, timely okay. becomes Atlas, which eventually becomes Marvel. Yep. But, but they were heavy into the monster books. That's right. And all yes, through the 50s. Uh, and crime and suspense. That's right. And yeah. As well as the EC comics, which were in the early 50s. Uh, that's where the horror really was in the ascendance. There were war comics still. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fantasy almost unheard of. But yeah. it kind of blew Fantasy as we think about it today. Exactly. Yes. Hard, heroic yeah. fantasy. I had those. a ton of the old war comics. That's right. Mm-hmm. The old 60s war and comics. And those, those were always those. popular really until the late 80s. And that's when they kind of just, they yeah. just... The genre just went away. We didn't want them anymore. Yeah. But in the 60s and 70s... It's every, really surprising they lasted that long considering right. the it 60s is. and 70s. That's correct. Yeah. That's right. And, it, and they were... Uh, but they were always guaranteed. But they sales. were they were a re- uh, reaction to the counterculture, in a, in, yeah, yeah, in a yeah. big way in they the were. late 60s. Well, it was also the World War II era of the young boys whose fathers went off to war. Also, the soldiers, the GIs, they liked this stuff. Yeah, that's kind of. And when they come back, they kept it up. So there was always that kind of a mystique around yeah. the World War. And a lot II of that stuff was getting published at the same time that some of the big war movies that is correct were being made. Yeah, because so, yeah. you think Dirty Dozen in '67 and stuff like that. That that all. Is all that same period, right? Right, yeah. And by the mid '70s, and this is post just post Vietnam, that wanes, mm-hmm. and uh, comics takes a little while. But really, you've got Sergeant Rock, which is really the last one standing at the end. I think for DC, uh, Unknown Soldier, Unknown Soldier as well. Uh, that's Soldier, right. Yes, yeah. yeah. those were the and Sergeant Adams. Fury and his Howling Commandos went into the early '80s as right, well. Right, exactly. But most of those, oh, were, a lot of those are reprints. Reprints, reprints, exactly. So they were they were trying to keep that character alive, but it just didn't have what so, it did. You've got those three periods. You got early superheroes, this post uh, Comics Code Authority, that's, yes. you remember, uh, the Wortham that's book right. basically lambasted uh, uh, comics, at, basically it's the comic book version, uh, or the printed version of the Red Scare. It's exactly yes. right. Comics corrupting the morals of the youth. That's why, from that early 50s on up into the 60s, there was so much stuff that was just inane uh, childish kind of stuff in it's many the ways. the only way they could Very, survive. So, uh, very uh, soft pedaled, very uh, uh, immature, very uh, lacking in depth, very shallow kind of material. Yeah. Um, then when you get into the '60s, when truly the beginning of the Silver Age as we know it today, really right. is Fantastic Four number one. Correct. Now we say that mainly in retrospect because you had five years DC's building up their new line, but right. again, it was slowly. Correct. You know, it didn't take off immediately. And the stories, if you read through some of those early ones, they're very good. Gardner Fox, Carmine Infantino, and many of these other guys, but it's still written very infantile. Yes. And that's kind of the difference, is because they've modernized, but it's still written because they're scared to death yeah. of being shut down, because yeah. many of their competitions did. They've got to make it sure that it's very moral and it's very fun, and kids can get it and not be yep. corrupted. Yep. It's hence the comic code. So... You've got a similar thing going on over at Marvel, but the difference there is that you've got more depth to the characters. That's right. Yes. And that's, that's Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Yeah. That's yeah. really well, and, where and that Steve, Yeah, all of the early Steve creators. Steve all the others. Many others. So you've got that, and then you've got the 70s, which we really what we would more mo- uh, call the, the Bronze Age. Yeah, we're, so we're gold, silver, and then bronze. That's right, because the Bronze Age is when the stories themselves matured to the point where you could, the comics code was relaxed, horror was brought back in a very limited fashion. You couldn't even say the word vampire. That's right. Or zombie yeah. uh, during the comic, during the 60s. You just couldn't do that. And you didn't Marvel used it. Zuvembi. Zuvembi, exactly. Which Stupidest is the those, word I've ever heard of. But that's how they got around it. Uh, it, it was very similar on television, too. Dark Shadows in the, in the 1960s. Yes. They couldn't say vampire. It wasn't until, like, 69 that they actually used that word, even though the character of Barnabas Collins had been biting necks for four years. Yeah. So what you see there is actually a mirror of the greater culture. We talked about in prior episodes. When you get into the 70s, you see a, a dramatic shift to realism in movies. That's exactly right. John Wayne's doing cop movies. That's right. What the hell is John Wayne yeah. doing cop movies yeah, that for? Is, that is a big part of the early 70s cinema is that new cinema and it was, idea of gritty realism, French connection, all of that stuff. And But that, believe it or not, a lot of that started, a part of this is, is the flower children in Vietnam and all that, but television actually was one of the precursors to this. Yes. Uh, if you've looked up, uh, look, up, look up Rural Purge on Wikipedia. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. This Where is when, in the 60s, the CBS you had... Dropped, like, uh, ten shows, ten shows, all, one, all of all which were made by uh, Film Filmways, which did the Beverly Hillbillies, 
Green all, Acres, all the country stuff. Mayor, went at Mayor, once. Uh, yeah, yep, exactly. Yep. And if you look back on it, it's it was a deliberate decision. In many respects, th- well, this was a question of life creating art, yes. not art reflecting life, because they said. But it was sort of they intend. They said our people don't want to see this. Our people, our younger viewers, want to see realism. Therefore, in 1970, even shows that were popular, they were all axed. Yeah, yep. those and then shows you were have, successful. Then you have the Mary Tyler Moore Show, All in the Family, Maud, and all those other changes. That yeah, take great I mean, modern. Exactly. Yeah, and by modern, I mean tied to the current reality. That's right. I mean, and you think about going from culturally yeah. aware, and it was uh, Gomer Powell, for instance. He, he's during Vietnam is when Gomer Powell and the word Vietnam in, or anything that's going on over there is never mentioned. Never mentioned. That was one of the. You think, I mean, you think about Mayberry RFD. That's right. To all in the family. That's or correct. To it was a deliberate shift, switch, turn of the yeah. shift. And yeah. so many people who were of that era bemoan the fact that all those quote unquote good shows are no longer out there. Well, I'm sorry. The culture had already left them. Yeah. It was a business decision made correctly. Yeah. People, people didn't want to see that much. So to bring this back to the topic, yeah. which is the comics. So, because again, yeah, I just want to get a general timeline here because I think there's a timeline of how this is accepted as well. Yeah. So you've got the Bronze Age where you see a lot of uh, more realistic. So you've got, for instance, Power Man uh, at Marvel. Uh, is basically a street-level uh, anti-hero because he's Luke Cage. He was in prison. They experimented on him. He becomes a superhero. Yeah. It's very much in line with the black exploitation yes. movies of the early 70s. You've also got Black Goliath that would fall right into that. Very much so. You've also got Black Lightning, black Lightning. at right. DC. Which was less successful, although he does have a TV show. Probably. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you've got Wonder Woman losing her powers and becoming a super ninja. She becomes... Um, uh, uh, Odd? <laughs> no, 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 no. She becomes uh, uh, the, the female chick from The Avengers. The TV oh, show. Mrs. Peel. She, Mrs. Peel. she becomes yeah. Mrs. Peel. Exactly right. She even looks like Mrs. Oh, Peel. Oh, yeah, she's wearing what you would call mod clothing, the bell bottoms, all the things, you know, yeah. all still, you know, always tasteful. Yeah. They don't show any cleavage, yeah. no butts, none of that stuff. That comes later. Uh, but it's very, it, it actually fits that. Yeah. Well, at one You've point got... in, in Marvel, though, Norman Osborn, uh, or no, uh, Harry. Harry. I was just going to get to that. You get to that, the yeah. Green Lantern dealing was, with drugs. You get to Spider-Man dealing with drugs. That was That, that was, was huge. huge. That's right. And it was Definitely deliberate. Huge. And a lot of it, it was two guys responsible for a lot of that. And DC side, it was Denny O'Neill, uh, who had been writing Batman for a while there. And basically, and he's one of the best art, uh, art writers in the business. He's the one that is writing Green Lantern, Green Arrow, that they've been told the book is failing. Neil Adams is the artist. we got to do something. So Denny says, let me take the training wheels off. And that's when he does this story about drugs. And this is after, right around the same time, but shortly after, Stan Lee, the government comes to him and asks him to do a, a anti-drug message. And he writes one where uh, a young man is you know, high on drugs and it's part of the story. The Comics Code Authority says, you can't do that. And Stan has a moment and he'll tell you the story. He says, okay, we're going to go without the code. <laughs> now that the code <laughs> is realized, they're irrelevant they come back to Marvel afterwards and go, uh, let's revise this code. And right after that is when all these things where now you can have Dracula, you can have vampires yep. and uh, werewolves. That, and shortly after that, Tomb of Dracula, uh, uh, Werewolf by Night, and the Monster of Frankenstein, as well mm-hmm. as Phantom Stranger at DC and the Spawn of Frankenstein and all these other horror, uh, yes, horror yeah, things. Spectre. Uh, the, the Spectre had been in there before. But yeah, he's was, a Golden Age character. He's a Golden Age yeah. character. And he had a book back in the early 60s, very superhero y, kind of a little weird. But in Adventure Comics, Jim Apero and Mike Fleischer, Fleischer, I think, is the one that wrote it. I, I may be wrong on this. Did a, a run of about 10 issues with the Spectre. In Adventure Comics. I in remember Adventure those. Comics, in you Adventure probably remember Comics, that. Yeah. Where it was very, very graphic at the yes. time. Yes. Uh, with violence. Yes, very and it violent. it still is seen as one of those watershed moments because everybody said, wait a minute. You know, the, he didn't last, but the book was really, really good. Yeah. In fact, so much so, there was even a couple unpublished stories that were not of that that were published later in a collection. So That was one of those many watershed moments. So you, you start to see this move kind of mirroring some of the, the other media. Yeah. Uh, moving into, away from uh, fantastical magic... Yep. And science fiction, right? right? Yep. And to more street level kind of stuff, but also in its own way, suspense and horror. Not suspense and horror as we might have thought of it in the fifties, right, which was graphic, graphic, graphic. It was really more suspense kind of right. stuff. Now, yeah. obviously, the Frankenstein book and even the the Man Thing and the Swamp, Swamp Thing. thing came Man Thing did time. come first. 
Yes. Um, <clears throat> You know, some of this, it's its not just, it's not there to scare people, right. uh, oddly enough. It's what its what would have later be called sophisticated suspense. Yes. When, when Swamp Thing in the early 80s came back and went into the Vertigo imprint, that's what they put on the tagline with Alan Moore and John Totalbin. It was sophisticated suspense. It was one of the few successful books that was, and if you read some of that stuff, Alan Moore being an absolute loon, mind you, but damn, he wrote well. And mm -hmm. he, some of those things are still classic. So this is all through the 70s. We had a big cultural meltdown at the end of the 70s. Right. Oddly enough, we also had a cultural meltdown in the comics. Yeah. The DC implosion in That's 78. Right. Right. Uh, Marvel, they got Jack Kirby back, and then they had a similar implosion of all his stuff, right. and so, Just, which was some really good stuff. Yeah. Really a shame some of that stuff didn't continue. Yeah, it was very original. It was, yeah. it was, he was not working off a template like he and Stan had done in the early 60s. They kind of together came up with those magic things you, many of those stories are very similar yeah. Iron Man's story is similar to Doc, Tony Stephen Strange's story to different others where yeah. something happens Peter Parker's story you get the powers, something you happens you get bitten by you, something, you get exposed to radiation you know, some magical right, device right. All the, the, but the way a lot all of goes. that ties into the culture as well yes. is, it's the hero's journey it's, is what it is well, but it's, it's taking this hero's journey yes. stuff this classic yeah and then turning it upside down because of, okay, we're in this age of rockets and nuclear bombs mm -hmm. and all this stuff. So, again, you are seeing it in other media. I mean, you're talking about things like Tarantula and Them. Oh, yeah. And all those great movies. That same thing is then starting to happen in the comic That's right. books. It's amazing yeah. how they, they reflect each other. In many respects, comic books are a great barometer for the culture. Yeah. Well, yes, and, and it, I'm going to get to some of that in a second. So, not to, to cut no, you off, ahead. but the in the 80s, then you see what I would just call a resurgence yes. of comics. In Marvel, as much as he is reviled in some circles, Jim Shooter yeah. saved Marvel Comics in the Very 80s. Very much so, yes. Yeah. He, all the best stuff happened under him. Now, some of the worst stuff happened under him. They killed Jean Grey. That's right. They sort of had to, but still annoys me. That's, well, I, there's a lot, of, a lot of discussion over that. Some yes. people, people blame Claremont for that. He went too far in an issue and they wrote himself to a corner nevertheless. But that one issue is one of the biggest selling of all time. Yes. I mean, that's essentially what this new movie is. is, is it is. Yes, exactly right. It it's is. Dark Phoenix. Dark, yeah, but you started to have real consequences in the comics. That's right. They were becoming sophisticated in the sense that um, even though in the 70s they dealt with some things, like Steve Englehart, he was great at this. Yes. Uh, when Captain America dealt with corruption in the government around the time of Watergate. Okay, oh, yes. But again, tied to what's going on culturally. Now, I think you see at the beginning of the 80s with the Reagan presidency, it was a time of, uh, well, it was one of the campaigns in the 84, Morning in America. You know, everybody was optimistic. Right. Uh, the economy was going gangbusters, you know. Things were looking really good. Gas lines were forgotten. Gas lines were forgotten. And, uh, uh, ultimately, that. Watergate's a memory. Watergate's a memory. Vietnam's the space memory. shuttles up. Yes. You know, we're back in space after how many years? And then you have the wall falling at the end of the decade. All these things are going on, and comics, in a way, are starting to. They're mirroring this, not feeding it necessarily, but they're also mirroring this, where there's bigger things happening. Because I mean. There's bigger things happening with. Uh, it's where you start seeing the first major crossovers. Right. Yeah. That was um, that was a result. Of you that. start seeing things uh, happen more line wide. Uh, seeing the the um, the. Well, with Marvel, this is already true. Where, where things are already a, a a larger universe. In DC, it was to some extent, but most of their titles were more self-contained. Right. Although, some of the best stuff that happened in Mar in DC was due to guys who left Marvel. Right. Uh, and brought that what was called the Marvel style over there. Yes, because and, and, and in many respects, DC was a little bit not afraid to be creative. The, hence the implosion, because they realized we can't afford to let you guys do all these great things you're doing because nobody's buying them. That's yeah. why you. That's why you lost all that. So DC tried a completely different path, failed, and then they came back around. And they realized, and you're right, it became a far more formulaic fashion by the end of the '80s because they realized certain things just don't work, but certain things do. Yeah. And the whole line, the whole crossover business, and I would you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would put the beginning of that at Crisis on Infinite Earths. Mm -mm. Nope. See, I knew you. I knew you wouldn't say that. Well, I'd have to look at the timeline because you had around the same time Secret Wars. Yeah, I think Crisis was a little ahead, but you're you may be right. Uh, no, but, I think you're right. I think Crisis is is first. 
and then Secret Wars. They're about a year apart. Right. Crisis was a bit more self-contained. It was 12 issues, same creative team. Yes, because it was a cutoff. When, when they right. went to the new issues after that, it was brand new. That's right. It was, it was, a, it was the first reboot. Uh, it, was, yeah. it was the true reboot of continuity. I mean, John Byrne came in and redid Superman. Yes. Who redoes Superman? Yeah. And you throw away all that, com that continuity becomes another alternate universe. Uh, and you have Alan Moore again, finish it out with the, uh, whatever happened to the man for tomorrow. And it was like the ending, and then, boom, you start over okay. again. Yep. So, But Secret Wars was much broader. It was a line-wide issue. It whereas was. this was something that was somewhat self-contained. Yes, you actually dealt with the ramifications of it in the individual books. Right. So that was probably the first big one that really started that sort of thing. Right. When you had all this yeah. side you're, you're issue You're not going crap. to just get them to buy these, these special events. You're going to buy every other book that we you publish. Buy because yeah. To get the real story, the full story, you need all these extras. Yeah. And so, and also at the end of this, you've got artists becoming the hot thing. Right. Yes, I know that that's a whole nother launching on a whole other era of when the artists like Todd McFarlane become prior names to him, unto themselves. Yes. Prior to him, you've got the, the image era, which is really the early 90s. Yes. You've got Byrne, Perez, Simonson. In the 70s, you've got Neil Adams. Right. Very um, good. Yeah, still you know, out there. People still were following Kirby. Um, Mike Grell. You know, Mike Grell. Yeah. The, I mean, Kirby really in the good. 70s. you got Mike Grell. You've got... Uh, Jim Starlin. Yep. You've got Epic, which is the creator own stuff, the entrepreneurial comics. Yes. Which I know that's a whole other Because they didn't want to squelch that. that, but they just didn't think you could market anywhere. So they come up, well, let's do Epic. Because, you know, uh, Heavy Metal's done okay. It yeah. still sells, so uh, let's just do and that. some of that stuff sold great. That's right. So then all that leads into artists are king, to the point where artists, again, it's Flash. What do you think of the 90s? Everything's Flash and no substance. That's right. Yeah. Oh, well, my gosh. I mean, that's not entirely true, but I mean, there's so much of that. And in the comics, it's kind of reflecting that. That's right. Everything's... Rob Leafield kind of exemplifies that in many ways. Yes. Because God love he, him. He, he's he's, he's a great very guy. creative. He loves the medium. He loves to <sighs> come up stuff. But he's very formulaic in the way he does things. You know, lots of guys are. But because his stuff sold so well, or at least perceived to do so, many copied him. And that creates that Leefield look, which is not fair to him in many respects because he was unique on his own. But that uh, the way he uh, went to market, all of a sudden everybody's trying to go to market that way. You might have had Jim Lee first. I'd have to go back and see. But I think Leefield was first. But you're right, Jim Lee. I, but Jim Lee did not become into his own until a little bit later. It's true. Uh, because but he was there. He was more. He was far more polished than Leefield. Very much so. Leefield was very because at this point. You can't be a George Perez very successfully where you're always late and you've got to have fill-ins. Right. Uh, John Byrne never never really suffered much from that. He was able to do that. Perez, for as beautiful as his work is, very independable. That's why he, you know, he had. I mean, his Fantastic Four run is still the best that you could ever ask for, in my opinion. Although absolutely, Kirby. outside of Kirby and Lee, absolutely. That's right. Yeah, it's well, the me, quintessential. Let me circle you guys back around a little bit though, because you've done an awesome job as I knew you would, really defining these eras and defining what's different about each one. And how we interact with the culture. Yes, we right. may, not a whole lot of interaction, but a lot right. of reflection. Yeah, that parallel of comics, TV, uh, movies, and all that. So I want to circle back, though, but what's, Why? what's the appeal? And, I, and I, again, zeroing in on the Silver Age being this first time when there's realism. Is that what the appeal is? Is that it, it really spoke to our real world then? Well, because we were... I don't know that we were the worried about Age the same it did as much. No, I would say the Bronze Age is the one that really began that. But I Silver think, Age teed that up. I yeah. think the appeal, it, though, it, goes back to the, the substance of what it is. Right. When we think of comic books today, and comic book material, we think of movies. It's only been the last 20 years, and especially the last 10 years, where you could do comic book material in the movies and yeah. do it realistically. Yeah. Yes. I mean, think about the Hulk and Spider-Man in the late 70s on TV. You know, very much uh, real-world special effects. They looked, you know, really crappy now. Yeah. Um, you know, because you couldn't, they didn't have CGI to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. You could only do that kind of stuff in the comics. Right. right? It's because out there, you can be fantastical. No, only now can you be fantastical in the Star movies. Wars notwithstanding, right. the stuff that it was doing there with the effects was mostly the miniatures, right? Yeah. Th that was, and y So 
you know, and lightsabers notwithstanding, there's not a whole lot of uh, guys wielding uh, you know, what we call now force lightning uh, until mu much later in the very end of the last movie. Um, those special effects just didn't exist until the mid to late 80s and then really start learning how to apply it. Yeah. So part of the appeal is what you can actually do with them. Also part of the appeal was the cost. Copies were printed, titles were printed by the millions per copy in the 40s. Mm -hmm. Okay. Part of that is they were sending them overseas. Yeah. By the truckload. Oh, yeah. Because it's cheap entertainment. Cheap entertainment, and it's quick, and it's disposable. Exactly. That's right. But this was in the newsprint era, though. Yeah. You would think we wouldn't have survived that, and we almost didn't, mind you. And it, But it was only at the beginning, uh, really towards halfway through the Bronze Age, where the newsprint started to go away. Comics bio rights should not and could not have survived, except they had created this following because they were a long-form storytelling. That's what kept you coming back. But that's a, that's very much a Marvel, Stan Lee kind of thing, long-form storytelling. Well, yes and no. DC did it, but they were... Later. They, they did it later. later. Well, when I say long-form... Running up to that, it's mostly what you would call a bottle book. A little... Everything, but, everything, everything, there were reset buttons. Everything comes to status quo ante by the end that's of the book. Yes. But they slowly begin to realize, wait a minute, we can still do that and be connective with what's gone before and what comes later. Yeah. And that slowly ramps continuity up. Continuity comes in. That's right. And then when you start with a shared universe, ultimately continuity is the only way that works. Yeah. You have to have that availability. And you slowly get to that point, and that's why you get people coming back and back. It's no different than soap operas. You keep right. watching it because... Well, yeah, you comics the are the printed version of soap operas. Very much so. Yeah. But there's an appeal to that because you can see... The growth in character. Yes, you get invested you, in the character. That's why it has survived because I think it is truly plots come, plots go, uh, but characters remain, and I think that's why they have a, they have coiled themselves into knots. All all comic book companies have to try and create new characters, and by and large, that almost always fails. And that's an unfortunate thing, is because or becomes secondary at best. Well, it, it's just right. You know, when, when I say that, I mean you know you, you don't hear of oh my gosh, wow, now we've got the new Superman or you know any of this stuff. All those they are very were, rare. You know, all those were created back then when character mattered. Continuity is both a, a boat anchor, but it's also a warp engine. It enables you to invest in these characters long term, and I think that answers your question: Why are they so popular? Because of their history, and so many people have been. Generation, generationally now invested in these characters. That's why you can't. So there's create a lot of stuff going on here. There's one. There's a fantastical element, mm -hmm. but combining it with real people problems, absolutely, which is kind of that hallmark of Stan Lee. That's of, right. Yes. Let's let's have these a teenager folks, who isn't popular. These be folks a hero. have to live in the real world. They yeah. feel like real people. Real That's people. Right. They have real problems. problems. That's right. Clark Kent can do that. You know, Clark Kent is essential to Superman. In the 50s and the Golden Age, absolutely not. He, yeah. he he was tolerated at best. Well, even the Silver, it wasn't really, it was much later. It that's wasn't right. really until he became... Well, John Byrne, really. Well, no, lot. in the 70s, you know, when he went to television, that's a great example of mm -hmm. following the culture. Yeah. yeah. You know, people don't realize that because, again, it only happened for a little while back in the 70s. Clark Kent became a television reporter. That's right. He only, you know, later went back to, to print. Um, but yeah, but they're real the people time, with real problems. Real people, real problems, but with a fantastical element uh -huh. that gives your imagination some play. That's it's correct. still escapist. Escapist. But it's also heroic. It's, it's very her critical. You cannot... That's, that's, see, that's you one big piece of it that I wanted really, to get back you, to. It, it, well, see, again, it's character-driven. The best characters are have either greatness or great flaws. Villains are, you know, Doctor Doom is the gold standard of villains. Why? Because he has such amazing potential, and yet he also has such amazing hubris. He's Marvel's Lear. Uh, absolutely, he is pro possibly the greatest villain, supervillain ever created. Yeah, uh, I would probably put him above and, uh, any. Others. I think there's another piece of it. And you're, you're, and that's why the movies haven't been able to get him right because they don't ever get that. Yeah, you're circling to it, but there's a sense of justice in all of this. Too. Absolutely. Justice always wins, eventually. In some form or another. It, it's, in it's, some, it's not always, perhaps, what we would call, you know, legal right. style Absolutely. justice. Oh, it it must be it, very, it's very moral in many respects, but it's also very, very nuanced now. Yes. Because the story medium has demanded, you know, as the readers become more sophisticated. The, right, and that's Because the we're not, you know, it, we're, yeah. 10 year olds aren't reading this much. When you look at the history, when you see the 70s comics start reflecting reality, just like the movies and television were. Yep. What you're seeing there is 
that loss of that moral rudder, that moral compass that we had as yeah. a culture sure. in yes. the 70s. You, you spend, we didn't know how to yeah. have heroes anymore because our, our everything was shaken. That's right. All right. Back in the 80s, again, not to you know say that Reagan was the panacea for the, the culture, but you see somebody there saying things are going to be better that automatically gives you you know people give it gives people hope so you start seeing that reflected in the culture and greater things right. so you see heroes someone in comics who you wasn't see heroes cynical. right someone you who see wasn't heroes cynical. in movies you know you see heroes in all forms of entertainment so comics are also reflecting that great uh, greatly so that's one of the, the appeal they whether they mean to or not maybe it's the culture influencing influencing the creators therefore influencing the books they are very much in tune with mm -hmm. The greater culture. Yeah, yeah. Denny O'Neill was famous for that. He was one of the first because so, he's very 1960s, late 60s, 70s, culturally oriented. Yeah. So then you eventually you're going to get into the anti-heroes along yes. with the heroes. The Punisher. The Punisher. Yep. Uh, you're going to see. Uh, and yeah, my, my references are mostly Marvel, but you're going to see yeah. Punisher. You're going to see Lobo on uh, the DC uh, side. Yeah. Wolverine. Uh, Wolverine is going to be the next one I was going to mention. Yep. All these guys who are. Um, uh, Wolverine really became an anti-hero later, even though he was uh, part of the early, you know, the X-Men. He was very much tempered there. Right. Yeah. He was seen as a loner who just happened to be there and became part of that and worked with the team. But eventually, Wolverine is not interesting because he has claws. No. He has, Wolverine is interesting because of the character he is, and that's because he is this anti-hero. Well, it's friction with Scott. That's part, of it. That's, that's part of it. That yeah. was one of the testing grounds. Eventually it became, you know, you don't only have so much friction. You have to be able to function as a team. So you have all this nuance, this character relationship. That's when it works. Chris Claremont was a master at it because he's juggling all these different groups, uh, individuals within these groups he's got, but they're working with each other and you've got these nuanced relationships. That's where... That's where they start with that. Now, it, it gets hard. That's when it becomes a double-edged sword. Because when you've got such continuity and such relationships that you're tied to, A, it's hard to keep up with. But really, more so than anything else, every time you change your writer, they would they would upend the apple carts and a lot of what and went do before they... and do what they wanted and <laughs> yeah. often invalidate what went before. Yeah, let me tell you, I hate that. Uh, that's, really, that's really the biggest problem. Uh... If, if, if There's no keeper of the character anymore. It's supposed to be the editor's. Yeah, they don't. But they because don't. They, they don't. It, it's it's like it's like take Stephen King. Nobody edits Stephen King anymore, right? Yeah. Uh, look at uh, J.K. Rowling. The first Harry Potter book was what, 250, 300 pages long. The last Harry Potter book was like four thousand pages, right? Because nobody freaking edits anymore when she become big enough. Right. Uh, that's my own side diatribe. Well, I mean, you know, well, I mean, true. but it's you, very true. You've been waiting since twenty eleven, I hear, for the. Uh, was it the Winds, Winds of Winter? Winter? Yeah, that's correct. Oh my God! So, yeah, I mean, I mean, Martin is like it's almost a caricature now that mm -hmm. he, well, you know. Part of that is you know that's not even edit. Push. Well, yeah, they're not pushing. They're not pushing. Well, because he's got a gazillion dollars. Why does he need to? So we've laid the groundwork here. When you look at what we've talked about, part of it's the characters and what they're doing. Type of books are a reflection of the culture, so they're tied into that. But now we've come to the point where it's turned around. The comic books are feeding the cultural touchstones. Yes. They're creating them. They're not reflecting them. I think part of this is twofold. One is the... I hesitate to say this because I don't want to sound negative, but a lot of our cultural creativity is just bankrupt. It is. Everything's been done. Everything's been done. Right. Um, Nothing and is original anymore. There's not been a, an original rock song in 15 years. Right. Um, at least. Uh, there's not been an original TV show. Now, granted, how you go about this stuff, mm -hmm. uh, everybody who has a favorite TV show is going to lambast me for that. It's all variations on a theme. It, it's true. It's all, it, But all creativity is. But I think part of it is our culture, there's so many things here. Our culture has gotten to the point where we have more leisure time than anything else. All right? Um, I mean, hell, in Europe, if you work more than 30 hours a week, you are you know, you're you're a slave to the to the corporate world. You know, you've got slave drivers for a boss who work more than thirty hours. In this country, if you work more than thirty hours, you're kind of lucky to have a full time job. Um, but we have so much leisure time, so because of that, we have a greater demand for entertainment. And so many ways to fill it, and I mean, there are so many so ways many... to fill it now. Thank you, technology. Before you had newspapers and books, then you had radio. Then you had television. And three networks. 
and you got three networks. <laughs> totally. Eventually, you got a fourth network if you're really lucky, a fifth network, uh, depending on where you were at. And that fifth wor- network might have just been PBS. Um, in some you know bigger uh, markets, you would have had more than that. But still, the the ones that were the fourth, fifth, sixth networks, they were showing reruns of the three networks. Yeah, I mean, as far as new content. Yeah, it's, it's, it's three networks until right. the until the uh, explosion of cable until HBO. Right, and even then, HBO didn't have a whole lot of stuff. It was mainly they were playing movies that yeah. had been in the theaters, and they had a couple of new shows. The big cable networks didn't have more than one or two new shows going on at a time, and it was fun because they didn't know what was going to work, so they just put on anything. Right. Hey, how about this? How about we go to a a, a nightclub and film all the stand ups? Right. <laughs> that was, well, yeah. you know, I mean, that's how you discover Sam Kennison. Right. And, you know, on HBO, I forget the name of the show now, but the main character was Martin. It was basically his quest to successfully or unsuccessfully, depending on the season, to get laid. That's all it was. And that was the entire series. Then you had Sex in the City, which is basically the same thing for the women. Uh, so, and then in the 90s, you start having more and more channels. You have independent networks, which again, still mostly showing reruns, but you're starting to get a flicker of, hey, we got more channels. Then the interesting thing happens. When you have the writer's strike, and all of a sudden you had reality TV. Mm -hmm. Survivor. That's that's reality TV. Well, I think it's the writer's strike. That's correct. They learned how to do television without the creators. And what this does is it frees up the creators to work for AMC. TNT, uh, the cable networks, Netflix, Netflix when it comes along <laughs> yeah, later. This right. this is later. Yeah, yeah. later. Uh, now Hulu, yeah. Amazon Prime. That's right. All of these are doing original programming. The best original programming is not on the big three networks anymore. No, it hasn't been in years. That's right. With the a interesting, few exceptions. With, with a few exceptions. But, yeah. but I mean, quantitatively. Absolutely, no question. The vast majority of it, show wise, count the shows That's are right. not on NBC, and, CBS, and, and ABC. And people don't care. And people don't care anymore. Yeah. And so, if you look at the stuff that's on TNT, AMC, BBC America, Absolutely. a lot of this stuff is comic book related, but we didn't know it. Preacher, uh-huh. comic book. Yep. Lucifer, mm-hmm. comic book. Walking Dead, comic, comic book. book. And tons of others. Because they're too busy creating. They didn't realize they the well was dry. They needed a new source. Well, comics, because of that magical continuity we've had for however long, it's fertile ground. It's unbelievably fertile ground. And even though we talk about it like comics were all over the place, it's still a very small sub-segment of the culture. That's right. Most people don't know about it. Up until the 90s, comics were still for nerds. Yeah. And the reason, and, and the way you can tell when comics became different is when you had all of these people buying, all of a sudden in the 90s, millions of copies of X-Men number one, X-Force number one, and all these others thinking they're going to be worth a lot of money in the future. It's like, well, no, when you print millions and everybody keeps them, no, they're not going to be worth that kind of money. I saw those books at the flea market this weekend for a dollar a piece. Yeah. A dollar. And they're everywhere. And they're everywhere. Well, so. <laughs> that was that was a comic books listening to the investor market. Yes, and yes. That, instead of worrying about making comic books, which yeah. they should have done. But, yeah. so you, but you still, you had this explosion in the 90s of all these new companies doing stuff created all this fertile ground to be mined later. Again, because being, it was being different. driven by the artist for, for a change That's rather right. than by a publisher. And then eventually though, by the end of the 90s though, the writer was king again. Yeah. Correct. And they realized I, Honestly, he, I think it's more too much the writer is king, but I think we need to get back to a better balance Well, we they had discovered when you had because be. there's lots of superstar writers out there. Jonathan Hickman's one right now that's getting ready to come back to uh, come back to Marvel. He's can- they're canceling all the X-Men books, every single one of them, and he's rebooting it, just like John Byrne did with uh, Superman. Wait, no, 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 no. Stop using the... Uh, sorry. I, I don't mean to jump on you. People use this word reboot. That's right. It, it does not mean what you think it means. That is correct. It is not that type of a reboot. It is starting... Crisis on Infinite Earths was a reboot. Was a reboot. Yes. There's no... Every time you put a new number one, is reboot. it best a reset? It is not a freaking well, reboot. Reset. J.J. Abrams' Star Trek? That's a reboot. Right. Not a reset. So sorry, it's it's a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> we noticed. Yes. yes. Okay. Well, you hit on something here too that I've heard other commentators talk about. That I've read a little bit about. Oh, how smart of them! Is <laughs> is this that there's very little 
uh, cultural, I'm not sure of the right word, but very little that common experience anymore. Back in the day, everybody watched the last episode of MASH. Right. Yes. It was a, we had common cultural touchstones. And right now, probably the closest that we have to a common cultural touchstone that everybody knows something about is probably MCU and Game of Thrones. Yeah, that's I mean, that's it. Those are certainly that's the largest it. one, yeah. But in the past, I mean, everybody watched Magnum P.I. Everybody watched MASH. Everybody watched... Interesting you say that, too, because The Big Bang Theory just ended its 12-year run between these two polls that you just mentioned. It's the exception. And, and barely got a mention. Too many... Well, it was yeah. there. A lot of watched it. But everybody's talking about... For well, every, it happened to end at the same time Game of Thrones I, re- I realized that. That was not But good I bet there. you could compare Big Bang Theory, which, by all accounts, is one of the most successful network shows of the last 20 years. Right. But I bet if you compared its numbers... As audience numbers to all in the family, I bet it's not half. Yeah, last episode of Mash. No, it's it's not. For uh, for the time period though, it was a huge huge deal. Yes, yeah, yeah because, and, and that's because enough. There's millions of that's other enough. There's, now, yeah, and there there's were not, not the common. So yeah, it's yeah. There's, and the interesting thing is, it exemplifies what we're talking about. Yeah, it is the glorification of comic book culture. Yes, it really is. Right, because the main characters, Penny aside. Is, are they're, they're nerds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're all about the comic books. Now, granted, they're all scientists, and I, not all scientists are going to be comic book nerds, but these guys were because that's how non-comic book people view smart people. You know? Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's full house in reverse. Yeah. It's everybody's an Urkel, and now Penny's the, the straight man. Yeah. So. So, it, may, it probably didn't start with Big Bang Theory. But it certainly is an outgrowth of this whole idea that nerd culture is cool now. Mm-hmm. And so where I was going a little while ago. How you know that nerd culture used to not be cool and how it is now. So when we were going to conventions back in the late 80s, late early 90s, 90s. Uh, we didn't get a whole lot of comic book conventions. Mostly but the, sci-fi, Star Trek, and yeah. a few others. But even the early comic book conventions we were able to go to, even co- had comic-related stuff, it was mostly a bunch of pimply-faced guys. Mm-hmm. Or Shatner put it, you! You're 30. You know, have you ever kissed a girl? You know, <laughs> living in your basement, your mom's basement. Now, granted, you know, millennials do that now, but it's a different thing. Yeah. Uh, they do it because they can't get a job. Or maybe don't want to. I don't know. Uh, they're the, the, then those guys game. did. Video yeah. games are keeping them in the basement. Right. right. You know, and if any millennials are li- listening to this and they are offended, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. Yeah, sack up. Uh, yeah, really. Man you, up. You should be listening to us anyway. Um, so, but now you go to comic book conventions... First of all, everybody goes. Yes. Popular people, non-popular people. Hot girls, hot guys. Pimply-faced guys, pimply-faced girls. It's everybody. It's everybody. All ages, too. And all Families, ages. fathers, mothers, children. When we were going, it would have been unheard of to have good-looking girls at these things. Absolutely unheard of. Now you see, because uh, the cosplay thing is huge, yeah. right? Yeah. Adults dressing up as comic book characters, and they put a lot of time and money into these things. Right. And some of them actually have sponsors, and they make money off it. I don't understand how, but they do. And well, I mean, you've got a person who bathes in milk and Fruit Loops on YouTube, making money that way. Everything is possible. Anything. That's is true. Possible. That's true. If the internet, if the internet has taught us anything. Is there is somebody out there for everybody, <laughs> and you can find them. But so we've see, so anyways we see this mainstreaming of a lot of stuff. Yes, you know you've got Spider Man and X Men movies in the early in the two thousands. All right, laying the groundwork. Granted, they do some of that material poorly. Some of it's good, but you know it's some it's a mixed bag. Yeah, nobody can do the Fantastic Four yet. Thank God Marvel's got it back. We're waiting. We're waiting. Uh, but now, starting with Iron Man, which is a very risky move, even though they had a couple of Hulk movies, they were not so good, no. especially that first one. But now you've got this risky move because you got Robert Downey Jr. does not have the best reputation. It's really the first movie that Marvel did as Marvel, right? All right? Exactly. And they did it right. Who else would play Tony Stark? 
looking back at it. Like nobody could ever. Nobody. Do exactly. Well, they pulled, and, and this is something that I always try to explain to my wife because she'll ask questions. About, she loves all these movies. She doesn't always get them. It's like, you got to understand, there's 60 and 70 years of this material. So, yes, they've done everything. So, when you pull in that Stark's an alcoholic, yeah, that was done in the comic books at one yeah. time. Yeah. All uh, these, when, which, you, when you pull in that he has a bad re, uh, relationship with S.H.I.E.L.D., that was done in the comic books. S.H.I.E.L.D. tried to buy Stark in Industries out from underneath Tony Stark one time. Yeah. Because Marvel knows all this because they published all this. That's yeah. why they can get the characters right and they can cast where they know that we're going to be consistent with anything we might want to do based on our history. Now, that's, part that's of the problem genius. with that, though, is that now the comic books are reflecting the movies. That's correct. <laughs> and, that's a, that, and that I, narrows things down big time. Yes. It, yeah. it, it, it squelches a lot of creativity that we've had in the past. Because, well, not, because we don't all of... Every, just because Chris Evan is, Evans is an absolutely awesome Captain America doesn't mean that every comic book that was awesome of Captain America in the past reflected that. Right. In, in, in fact, many did not. Uh, well, there's and, nuance there. I mean, you see it in things like the costumes, for instance. Captain America's comic book costume has taken on elements of the movie costume. Correct. Samuel L. Jackson is a fantastic Nick Fury. He was basically the basis of Nick Fury in the Ultimate Comics line. That's right. Because they always said, if they ever do movies they, about the Ultimate Comics, they want Nick Fury to play... Or they want Samuel, Samuel L. Jackson, Jackson to play Nick Fury. <laughs> and they got him. That's right. Um, but the original Nick Fury bore no resemblance, had nothing to do with it. So no. they basically sidelined him. And they did. And even in the comics now, there is a son of Nick Fury right. who is black. With an eye patch. With an eye patch. Talks a lot like Samuel L. Jackson. Too. Yeah, looks a lot like him. That's right. Okay, fine. Comics are always doing contrived stuff. But, you know, that's just one example. Hawkeye's costume. Yeah. Looks like it does in the movies. Mm -hmm. That may be a good thing because that was, you know, that purple monstrosity was kind of goofy. That's right. But, you know, a lot of comic book costumes aren't meant for the big screen. No, that's right. They're, they look they're good drawn. With that beautiful four color, you know, all the, all the beautiful. You have to understand, too, comic books, one of the reasons they sold so well for children is the bright colors. It's very yeah. attractive for children. That's true. That's, that's very true. started a lot of this. People liked watching it just for the colors that you could do. So, therefore, you would create an artist. By definition, would create something that really brought in a completely different palette. That's why Hawkeye is purple in the comics, and Quicksilver is green, light green, and then he became light silver because they had enough, they already had the Hulk, and all the, you know they're trying to balance these primary colors and things like well, that. Well, and also the the villains tended to have the either muted or mixed colors. Right. It was the heroes that had the primary colors. That's correct. So it was it was very deliberate. And, yeah. uh, and it was uh, sooner or later they they learned to work that medium very very well because if you look at some yeah. of John Romita's Spider-Man stuff in the seventies, yeah. all the fashions are seventies fashions. Oh yeah, but before, God help us. Before <laughs> that, nobody cared about that. Yeah, that's just one more example of uh, art reflecting life. Yeah. So now that I think because it, like we said, the cultural stories have been kind of milked. And that's partially because we've got so many places to do the stories. Yeah. I think we're kind of sick of them. How many times can you do a group of people that are friends with each other and do a sitcom about it? You know? Yeah. I mean, that. I mean, essentially, that's Big Bang Theory as well as Friends, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The circumstances change, mm -hmm. but it's hard to come up with circumstances that are fresh enough to do. It's only if you can get the right cast and the right characters. Now. Then it works. In five yeah. years, there'll be another successful group comedy like Friends and Big Bang Theory, but they don't have multiple ones at the same time, right? They um, try, but... They try. They only, we can only really sustain one in a But even so, it's always niches. I mean, you right. know, there's some family yeah. comedies. Yeah. You know, there's uh, everything... And there's also a lot of let's make fun of what has gone before comedies, right? So you've got some stuff that's said about the 80s or the 90s, you know, in that kind of time frame. And it's kind of lampooning them, but... You know, it's nobody cares because some of the shows are good. Well, because and they're wanting the people that lived through that to watch these shows. So get the nostalgia. The nostalgia. Yeah, right. nostalgia is a is big and business. Nostalgia yes. runs in about twenty year. Right, and that's one of the reasons that comic books are tied the way they are in the nerd culture, it's, and they can't seem to break out of what they got because people that nostalgia is so entrenched within. That's why Captain America and Iron Man and all those guys are still here. And so many, they can't get new ones really brought on because nostalgia is too powerful for, for many of the niche buyers. Marvel tried a thing 
uh, a few years back where they were basically replacing all the old white guys. And they were doing it with y mostly young female ethnic characters. Yeah. And a lot of people didn't like it. And contrary to what these social justice people will say, it wasn't because we didn't want to see white guys replaced by ethnic females. It's because they just didn't do a good job. Or it's ham-fisted. Or why do you have to replace them? Why do you have to... Because in a way, it's a disservice. Why do you have to have a young black girl become Iron Man? First of all, it's Iron Man, right? Um, why can't you have the two characters exist side by side? Which is where we've, we've become now. Ultimately, that's where you've come around. That's right. And they just... They, they played around because this whole legacy Because it doesn't matter, idea. ultimately, I always found in, in comic books, it didn't matter what color or whatever, anything about the character. If it was a good character, it was a good character. That's exactly right. Storm's a great character. When you build the character based on on these physical attributes first, ultimately it's weak. Well, so it, it's shallow. It's right. It's it, does, one it doesn't have the... It's when exactly it's right. just about the thing that is yeah, why, why should different the, about the external the character. characteristic. That's right. Yeah, and then it's and because, boring. Yeah, because one of the reasons that Doctor Strange and uh, Tony Stark and many of these other characters are interesting They've got a backstory that makes sense. Part of the problem with those, as the social justice warriors would right. have, have us believe, part of the problem with those characters currently is that they are a bunch of white guys. There are not a whole lot of ethnic superheroes even today. Part of that's because of when they were created. We all get that. Right. If you were to create Doctor Strange today, you could just as easily do an Hispanic or black man Absolutely. or even woman. Yeah, sure. As that character and drop them into those same situations. Sure. But Doctor that's because the. <clears throat> but Doctor Strange exists. But Doctor Strange exists. There you go. That's the issue. Um, you can't create from scratch. Yeah. They've tried many times. The new universe. But, well, yeah, but my point is, though, the those characters, the thing that defines them is not the fact that they're white guys. Correct. The problem with the ones they've created to replace is the fact that they're not white guys specifically. Is what they're trying to do. I think that's why it's, and it's failed. And it screams that. Yeah. So they've taken what is essential to those characters and thrown part of that out, thinking that this other thing was the essential part. We're going to get rid of that, you know, because that whole white guy thing. Well, we don't want to do that. It's anymore. like it's like replacing a giant man or, or the Adam. Ray Palmer <clears throat> is a white guy. Got to get rid of him. So we bring in Ryan Choi, and he doesn't last very long. Ray, Ray Palmer still comes back. Because Ryan Choi was not ever developed to the point where anybody liked him very much. Well, part of that's the problem is that it's hard to like a guy or girl that replaces a well-loved character. Exactly it. That's right. The problem with the fact that you well, can't get new characters is because you have the old characters that are beloved. It's, it's being forced anyway. That's correct. It is. I mean, it's... That's why they can't. You know, it's, it's the same as, okay, let's write out Henry Blake and bring in... Sherman Potter. Sherman Potter. Well, it took three seasons for anybody cared about Sherman Potter. Right? Yeah. And only because it turned out to be a really good character. Well, yeah, and that was part, you know, they wrote him well and, you know... Uh, uh, well, and that's when MASH really started to get deeper. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's very much so. It was still very light comedy up through... Up Until through Henry Blake died, it was light comedy. That's right. Yeah. And but, the, uh, you know, for the most part. Go yeah. right back. <clears throat> Marvel had a history of doing characters that were other than rich right. white guys. Mm -hmm. And it worked. Again, a, a character like Storm had a great backstory. She's still the exception. Yeah. I mean, I mean, realistically, she still is the exception. But, but it, you know, very few have you, survived. The fact that you she can. was a black woman from Africa is not what wasn't central to her character. It was part of her background. Right. It wasn't the it, central. I mean, in some ways, it was character. central to her because it's part of her background. Right. But, but it wasn't the identifying element. Right. right. She's the bridge between yeah, because Scott and, and Wolverine. There yes. are very and few. Uh, Luke Cage is a great example. He had to basically be recreated out of that black exploitation characteristic. Somehow he survived that. Yeah. And he, and very the, few did. Very few did. And part of the reason was because they brought in Iron Fist. His book was about to be canceled. They brought the two of them together and recreated it completely into this buddy cop thing, which worked. Yeah. And then all of a sudden. Luke Cage is not just this black guy that's black for being black. And Danny Rand is not this pseudo-Asianic uh, white savior guy. They have a reason for being together. That works, and it's fun. They that's explored the real relationship exactly between right. the two Because it characters. became about relationship, not about ethnicity. I think when you look at the... Uh, maybe how some of this stuff came about. When you look at some of this stuff, the people who were 
influenced by Marvel in the 60s, 70s, and 80s are the people who are creating television and movies today. Yeah, yeah. George R. R. Martin will tell you. Matter of fact, George R. R. Martin, I forget which book it is, he had a letter printed in one of the Marvel comics. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, he, he was a big fan. He was a big fan. Stephen King, uh-huh. huge fan. You know? So, in fact, if you go back to some of those very early 60s and 70s letters pages, many of the creators' names will appear as those who sent in letters. It is actually kind of scary. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. they yeah. created him. Yeah. yeah, Jim Shooter, he's one of them. I mean, yeah. as a kid. He was a writer at 13 exactly. for Legion of Superheroes. 13! That's right. And he did a very pretty dang on good he job. He did. He did. Well, he was he really brought the first Marvel esque approach right. to right. characters. It was to the Legion because it wasn't the regular continuity. Exactly. So they could, they, they, they would let really him play care. a little bit, and which is a shame the Legion's not even being published anymore. I know. Yeah. I know. So, with all that influence of people who read comics, I think it's natural for them to say, "Hey, you know, we've got technology. Let's bring these guys to the screen." Now, why DC can't do it is beyond me, other than Wonder Woman. Well, I'll give you two words, Zack Snyder. Well, yeah, yeah, but I mean, why can't why can't they say, hey, you know what? You're screwing this up for us. Look at what these guys are doing. Well, and they did it with John Favreau. I love John Favreau. He did a fantastic job, and he continues to do a fantastic job. But he does not have the keys to the entire kingdom. He's not the king. He's just yeah. a minor duke. Mm-hmm. And it was when he did the second movie, Iron Man Two, and it was, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't let you do all of them, John. Uh, and then that's when we brought in uh, Kenneth Branagh, who did uh, Thor, uh, and we Joe Johnston to do Captain America. And they realized who else was going to do Thor other than Kevin Kenneth Branagh? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's <laughs> and it was. I mean, it's pretty amazing that it shows you the power. Well, because he's got this background. <clears throat> yeah, he was to able bring to, in a, to an nail that to the wall. Shakespearean yeah. director. Yeah, look at the people that got involved. Rene Rousseau. Yeah, uh, Anthony it? Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins. Oh my God, really? That's right. Well, and that's you know a lot of that was Branna, but a lot of that was the realization of yeah, we're going to do this. Is not just a comic book movie. This is a good movie. Who'd you yeah. get in Man of Steel? Yeah, was well, Zack Snyder? No, 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 no. Character wise, actor. Who'd oh, Henry get? Cable. No, 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 no. I'm talking about um, for Jor El. You hit no, what, no, no, Russell Crowe. Well, that's a little bit later, but I mean, I mean. Yeah, you get him, but I, yeah, Kevin Costner. Kevin Costner, that's the yes. name I'm trying to think oh, of. You, oh, uh, yes. Uh, which and, and Russell, I mean, these are great actors. That's right. They're not Rene Rousseau and Anthony Hopkins, okay? Well, I'll submit to you that it wasn't It wasn't the casting that was the problem there. I think all those... Well, no, were, that was the writing. That was, That's exactly right. And I think that Zack Snyder had... He did a great job with Watchmen. I will always love him for Watchmen. He did what nobody else could do with Watchmen. But that's <clears> very <throat> different than Superman. And yes. And... I think what they should have done, they realized, okay, Zach, you did a fine job with Man of Steel. Now let's hand the keys to somebody else. And that's what should have happened. You know what's interesting? They repeated the same mistake that got done in the late 90s and early 2000s with Man of Steel. And they even made a point of it in Infinite Crisis Mm -hmm. when they did yet another reboot. And that is that part of the thing was... true reboot, not a reset. Yes, true reboot. True reboot. Part of that was reboot reset because they never th- DC doesn't really throw anything away except that first one. Yeah. Uh, but part of the problem there was that they realized we've gotten so dark, yeah. and that was one of the things they kept bringing out. One of the motivations of the main villain, who was the Superboy right. character from the original timeline, was that his his anger was on everything so dark. You're evil, and they did this. That they did, and they recognized it. And they tried to go past that. And yet they make the same damn mistake. That's correct. In Man of Steel, uh-huh. and and worse, the comic books themselves actually followed suit for a while until DC finally wised up and they did this. They had they did the New Fifty Two, which base which was a that was a reboot. That was a reboot, and it was the first time you'd ever done. You had Action Comics number one, Detective Comics number one, never done before. They did that for them, and they and, and in many respects it was very successful in many ways. Some things, however, they tried new. They didn't last, but. They recognize very shortly after that, this is too dark. We're losing things because not all of these need to be Christopher Nolan, Dark Knight, Batman. Yes, he is another, another problem some do, there. We want some of that. And it took them... It a works few, for Batman. It, it doesn't work it for doesn't, everything. Even that, it doesn't right. always work for Batman either. Mm. It does a lot of times. Well, I mean, that that got to be such a thing that it was it became cliched. I mean, that's in exactly. a Deadpool movie. That is exactly right. right. It was like, oh, you're so dark. Are you sure this isn't a DC movie? 
Exactly. I mean, that's, that's... That is exactly right. And I'll give DC credit, the comic books anyway, when with their line line wide reset, reset, re, which called Rebirth, which was 2017, I think, might have been 16. Yeah, something like that. It's yeah. one of those two. And basically, it was a refresh. It was a dust off, and we decided we're going to go back to what's really good. Sometimes it is dark. I mean, actually, but most of the time it's probably not. Yeah, they they well, you know, they brought some uh, people who used to be Marvel only guys. Right. John Romita Jr. started doing DC. That's right. A Romita doing DC is unheard of. He did Batman, and it was good. He did Superman. That's right. I mean, they were excellent. They were very different. So, anyways, the appeal. The appeal is broad. It's broad. It's character driven. It's yes. character driven. A sense of justice. There's heroes. There's heroes. And villains. It, it might, yes, and villains. Well, good heroes have to have good villains. Correct, yes. One of the things that, uh, the, the, to me, the two movies that exemplify, even though they're not the most successful, but the two movies that exemplify what it means to be a good Marvel movie and a good DC movie, because there's only been one. Captain America, the first Avenger. Yes. Love it. That's my absolute favorite it's, it's of the whole still series. Is. And Wonder Woman, That's which right. is basically Captain America as a woman done in World War One. Yeah. There are so many parallels. And, you know, I, I don't see how anybody can deny those, but it was done so well. She was a true hero. That's right. She was written properly. She was acted well. It was directed well. Patty Jenkins deserves all the accolades she can get and more because she did not conform to all those expectations. Yeah. And, because Zack Snyder was still in the ascendancy when Wonder Woman was being made. And she could have bowed to that, but she didn't. She did it her way. And she's the one that's laughing all the way to the bank now because she's yeah. become one of the most popular and perhaps... A I, very sought-after director. Exactly. After that. Yes. Because and, she knows... And Gal Gadot, what, again, terrific actress. Really did a, an amazing she job. She made me forget part. Linda Carter. And that's right. And that yeah. was hard to do. And because for guys our age, that's, that's hard, hard to do. But Linda Carter still had, had the culture for that. Even though many people never saw it, everybody knew who she was. Yeah. But it, this is a whole different thing. This movie, much more serious, much more realism. Right. But she was amazing in it. She was well, amazing in it. That's right. So, but you, she still was the hero. Yeah. You know? That's and great. that's. that's and, and she did it for. She wasn't the accidental hero. That's right. And she, she wasn't, wasn't the revenge-based hero. And she, she wasn't Superman and Batman. And she, she was not defined in relationship to a male character either. In fact, Chris Pine, Steve Trevor, was defined in relationship, relationship to, to the her. female character. To her. That's one of the reasons why it was so original, it was so fresh, and everybody says, well, duh, that's exactly what we should have. Absolutely. And the best part of the Justice League movie was her bits. That's correct. Yeah. Oh, it yeah. really was. Yeah. So <clears throat> the appeal is broad. You got the heroics, you've got the creators who grew up on this stuff now bringing it to the rest of the culture. So part of it is they built their own success. They laid the groundwork unintentionally when they were doing the comics, not realizing that one day it, they would take over popular yeah. culture. Stanley acted like comics took over popular culture. They didn't. No, they did not. No. A lot of people knew what they were. Right. But that doesn't mean they took over the culture. No, they became Not like they far have more, now. They were far well more well known by the time he finished than they were when he oh, began. Oh, absolutely. Of course. But I mean, there's a point where Marvel goes bankrupt, right? Oh yes, in the late nineties. Yes, yes, it almost went under. It was about to be, you know, I don't want so, to say I mean, it was going to be shuttered. This, but, I mean, well, they were going to go bankrupt. Yeah, they yeah, were. Yeah. So yeah, so I mean, this is this has not always been the thing that fueled culture. I mean, it well, isn't. I mean, no. comic book, this almost went under on several times. You know, back in the 50s, it almost shuttered the entire industry. In About the every 20 years it does it, really. That's right. Yeah. We're due for it again, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Well, and what will happen... And I'll Except make, we got the movies. Well, I'll make the prediction. What will happen is, in a period of time, if Marvel does it well, this will not happen. But sooner or later, they're going to slip, and maybe they'll slip two or three times. Yeah. Then the money people will get worried, and then it will start to wane. And then if it wanes... Then it will be all about the glory days, but they're not making any new ones. Yeah. But there's always a reaction. There's always a, a pendulum. Yes. Eventually, we'll get back to Dirty Harry type movies and get away from Fantastic. We'll I be, don't know that we'll ever get back to we'll Dirty back. Harry kind of movies. Though. It'd be something else. I don't. And, uh, and the reason, and I mean, you know, that gritty, no special effects kind of character. Yeah. Because mm -mm. you know we still have plenty of action heroes. Sure. But we have a lot of explosions with them. That's correct. Well, thank you, Michael Bay, okay. but well, I don't know that we'll, that's going we'll away anytime soon. We'll go back to Die Hard then. Okay, okay. You know, I mean, there, there's Bruce uh, Willis is still making those movies. And, you know, realistically, he's a great example of what is a... He's not, it's not a comic book character, but he's a great example of what could have been a comic character made into a movie. Because mm -hmm. he's a reluctant anti-hero. Yeah. In many ways. Mm -hmm. 
He so he is typical of that kind of character. That's one of the reasons why those movies do so good. Well, unfortunately, though, we are in the era <clears throat> of the only really way to be successful in the movies long term is with franchising. Yes. Yes. Well, be, yeah. Be bigger than anything you, else. You will not see bigger that go CGI, away. You ha- well, it's not even that. You have to have a reason to keep making movies that people want to see. Yeah. And it's really comic books in in the movies is exactly that. The reason comic books you keep buying them, you love the characters and you love the world that's been well, built. Same with the movies. It's a franchise movies, thing. Yeah. The movies are. It's it's part of being a, an outgrowth. Well, I mean, started before the comics, but. Because you have the multiple Star Wars movies, right. you have the multiple Jurassic Park movies, you have That's the right. multiple Mission well, Impossible. Those movies, were all, all franchises. Yeah, the Terminator movies. Yeah, Terminator. Yeah, there's a new what? Terminator coming. Franchises we like make the story. Money. That's right. We people want... like stories. Wait, I mean, that means long form. We want the long form story. We are we are beyond tired of the reset button being pushed at the end of the episode. That's that... and that started in the nineties. That's right. You start seeing certain TV shows. Develop a long-term long plot arcs. arc. Yeah, that's long-term right. Whether arcs. it be Star Trek or Babylon Five, Babylon Five was or any of these the others really started it. W- Lost, Lost is later, but later. yes, but that's, that's Babylon Five was really the yeah. first that proved because it was a beginning, middle, and end, and it's right. We're not some that. just deep space franchise. No, so we mean something. That's we stand right. for something, and that was one that proved. Wait a minute, you did this on what kind of budget, and you made it happen, and it's that good. So much so, it's even stood the test of time. That was that was a watershed moment. That convinced the studios, maybe this is not... Because if it weren't for Babylon 5, Lost may not have ever gotten made. Possibly, yeah. yeah. Or in stories, you know, well, even when you look at the two later treks, Voyager and Enterprise, they had a bit of a continuing storyline. That's correct, that's right. They were they both a little to. episodic, but there was an overall but when, arc. And they realized it because once they started going with that longer form, the ratings went up and didn't go away. They realized, wait a minute, we don't want episodic. So we can have a little bit. When you start looking at how we're going to do this in the movies, what do they do? The creators turn to what they grew up with, the episodic stories, and they bring them to the big screen yeah. in a way that now you can. That's yeah. right. You think and of it, one of the quintessential movie-esque series or set of issues? It's the Kree Scroll War in the last 10 issues of the first 100 issues of uh, Avengers, you know, basically 90 to 99. Uh, it's, I think it's 89 to 97, technically. Yeah. You couldn't do that in a movie. This is prior to Star Wars. You couldn't yeah. do those special effects. You couldn't even do those special effects at the time of Star Wars. Yeah. Right. You couldn't do them until you got into the late 90s, really. And so that's when you start thinking, hey, maybe we can do this. But it was such a risk because nobody had done them before. That's right. So until Marvel took that step and said, we're going to use our own money. And they really, they risked the everything on those, those characters right. <clears throat> or those movies. And it wasn't really until the first Avengers movie that it paid off. Well, I don't know. That, well, they were all successful, but the the interconnectedness was dependent upon that first Avengers in 2012. If that had not been the mega hit, you may not have seen it go forward. It may not have gone. It may have. It may not have gotten the way that's it has correct. now. It, it would have, but it, without a future, the, all the interconnectedness started from the first movie. They well, started correct. laying the groundwork. That's right. Yeah. But from if, the very beginning, if it beginning, was going to fail, that's where it would have failed. That was the weak point. So, anyways, which was not weak at all, of course. That's. That's why it's popular. You know, I mean, all those reasons. Story, characters. It's long-term storytelling, and you got the means to do it. And everybody else has, been, has done everything that you could do. Thanks for being with us here every week at Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Be sure to spread the word on your social media accounts. Follow us and retweet us. We are on Instagram and on Twitter at Snakes and Otters. Let your friends know that they can find us on Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and on YouTube. Just search Snakes and Otters Podcast to find us. And please, remember to leave us your comments and reviews. It helps people find us. And you can always send us an email at snakesandotterspodcast at gmail.com. I'm Martin. I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Catch us next week. Same snake time, same otter channel. <laughs>